Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today, waking up early. And uh, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to, to speak to you today um, and to be at this year's sci-fi talk. Um, so in the talk today, what I'm trying to do is to illustrate how we have leveraged the open source tools to build large scale. I think I'm just going to hold the microphone because it just makes my life easier. I move around a lot. Um, and so basically, as I was saying, um, what I'm going to try to do in, in the talk today is to illustrate how we've leveraged the open source tools to both build large scale single cell data sets and um, how to transform how we think about drug discovery. So most of the biomedical research aims really to treat or manage disease conditions. But if we want to understand um, in disease, we first need to understand what does it mean to be healthy, because then we will hopefully be able to map what went wrong such that we can design intervention strategies to prevent or to treat the condition. And the way that I've been thinking about that is to combining single cell transcriptomics with computational analysis. So when we're thinking about single cell transcriptomics, there are really two things baked in here. One of them is why do we want to use single cells? And the other is why do we want to use transcriptomics? The reason why we want to use single cells is if you are only going to look at the bulk of an organ or in the illustration here as a class of juice, you will have a very hard time telling if any of the fruits that made it into the juice um, or which of the fruits have made it into the juice contributed to the rotten flavor. Because at the time that you get the juice, you can't really distinguish the parts anymore. This is also true in disease, because it's very rare that the disease is equally spread through an organ. So it will be heterogeneously present in certain regions of the tissue or be affecting differentially cell populations. And the reason why we then focus on the transcriptomics, so the RNA measurement in each of the cells, is because unlike the genome, which is for the most part similar across all the cells in a single individual, the transcriptomics is variable cell to cell and really offers us a close view of real-time um, gene expression. So providing a proxy to our cellular function. And so the way that then I have been putting this together is to really collect, collecting all the data into what we described as single cell um, transcriptomics atlas. And if you are wondering how does a reference single cell atlas look like, you can imagine this is a very large sparse matrix um, that basically you can imagine your rows are thousands to millions of cells. And then your columns are going to be something in the order of 20 to 50,000 genes. And that is the data set that we have to start working and to start asking questions. And so we like to think about having kind of like the reference. Let's see if my mouse actually works. Yes. So when we have kind of like the reference atlas, these are the ones that serve as comparison to perturbation data sets that we might build, or even kind of um, different states of the cells that we can capture, for example, with natural aging. And um, I'm going to walk you through the process, the messy process that happens until we get to that clean, sparse matrix that I want you to keep in mind. So when we were building Tableau Sapiens, which is one of the first drafts of the Human Cell Atlas. It all starts with a very interesting but incredibly complex of organ procurement. So when you are procuring organs, you need to get consent from the families or the legal representatives of the donors. And we want to make sure that we really respect and value this incredible resource and the gift that we are being given as researchers. So we deploy very specialized teams of surgeons and our subject matter experts that can perform the cell type dissociation to the best conditions for each of the organs that we have procured. 
and then we process the rest of the cell towards the RNA extraction and sequencing in a centralized manner to minimize the number of technical batch effects that we might introduce for the overall data set. <laughs> so in Tableau Sapiens, what we have um, as the first pass of the data set is about half a million cells from 24 tissues and 15 donors. But additional to this incredible collection of transcriptomic profiles, what we also have is clinical metadata. And one of the goals of providing all of these in a format that is easily accessible is that we are hoping the community can take this data set and really start asking questions and improve how we're thinking about disease treatment. So this is kind of like the overall summary. But what we have in terms of kind of like processing the data in the background, I think most of it is tools that are going to be familiar to this audience. So we start by um, processing the data. So we, after it comes out of the sequence, the data is demultiplexed. It then gets aligned to a reference genome using star or cell ranger, depending on the method that we use. We then get um, a, ra a raw uh, count cell gene matrix that then we perform ambient RNA removal with decon X. And then we do dimensionality reduction harmonization. So we build the latent representation of the data using SCVI. We then do community detection using the Leiden algorithm. And we tend to visualize, it's a common visualization technique in the single cell community to use the UMAP. And so what I have here on the right side of the screen, it's a UMAP graph of all the cells in Tableau Sapiens where each of these dots is an individual cell and I have colored them by their tissue of origin. So this is the minimum amount of processing of the data that you can do to start exploring it. And you can look at different metadata variables, so things that you know about the data, like which donor um, contributed these cells or which library method did we, did we use? And we have other information about kind of like what do we expect these cells to be an epithelial or to be, uh, for example, an endothelial, so the cells that make the, the blood vessels. And then we can kind of like take the next step and say, okay, so I expect these organs all to have blood vessels, so to have endothelial cells. Um, how do the cell populations in here broadly look like. And remember that our matrix is cells in one of the dimensions and genes in the other dimension. So we know which genes we have because we are aligning to the human genome. So we can look, for example, in the lung, which I'm highlighting here with the blue circle, that we have two clusters of this data and we have genes that are differentially expressed in the, in the clusters, and we found something similar in the muscle. But we can't really go much further than this until we do the next step of the data processing, which is perhaps the most challenging, but also the most important one, which is to annotate each of these dots. So at this point, each of the dots that we have in the screen is really kind of like a blob of unlabeled data. So we don't have the labels to start with. And this is still a very challenging problem in the community because at this point, I hope you are with me, that we have already done an incredible amount of processing to the data and we still don't have what, something that we can consider to be ground truth labels. So we need to somehow annotate this data set to be able to proceed to the next steps. And so what we want to get to is from the unannotated data set into an annotated data set, ideally using an automated tool. So at the beginning of the, when we were building the first atlas um, for the Tableau Muris atlas, we actually did this process entirely manually because there were no references that we could have used 
five years ago. But nowadays, there are plenty of data sets that other groups uh, besides us have contributed to the community. And so we can really think about this problem as basically having a reference data set and a computational method that has been designed to address um, this, this task. Um, but so when we were looking around in terms of which method is the best one to use at this large scale of data, I think, no surprise, there are um, plenty of tools. So what we decided to do was to actually build an annotation framework, um, which we called Popular Vote, or POPV in short. And so what we, we do with POPV is we take advantage of all the contributions that people have done. So instead of trying to go and say, okay, I really want to cherry pick this method because I think this is going to work best in this data set and then for another tissue I might cherry pick a different one, we decided to treat this as a query and a reference problem. And so the query is the unannotated data set, so kind of like our two label data and then we have annotated reference data sets, and these usually um, are at the tissue level, so and this is still work in progress to actually have an integrated reference at the atlas level, but we do have um, references at the, at the tissue level, and so then we run all the algorithms in the, to annotate the data set, and we call consensus. So what POPV outputs is a label for each of the dots, for each of the cells, that has the prediction for the individual methods plus the consensus prediction. And I'm happy to go into details if, if people have questions um, offline. But these allow us to get very quickly to an automated cell type annotation. So until then, we can really kind of like do the annotation without having a human in the loop. But one of the things that we really try to accomplish with the tabular data sets and tabular sapiens in particular is to build a gold standard data set. And so for that, what we did is at this step, we brought the tissue experts back in the loop. So the same group of people that were there at the very beginning that did to the best of their knowledge and ability, the dissociations for each of the tissues, we brought them back in and asked them to revise the automated annotations. And so then we are left with what we consider the annotated reference data set that has been validated manually by experts in the community for each of the individual organs. So this is the process that we took um, for Tabula Sapiens, but as I've kind of like alluded, alluded through the talk, we are facing um, kind of like an exponential increase in the number of cells in the data sets. So this is um, a reasonably up-to-date figure of the number of cells we have per data set. Um, and that is coming hand in hand with the increase in the number of tools that are available. And we are really kind of like facing a challenge now of how can we take advantage of all the incredible work that the community has put together? And how do we really take it to the next level? And my colleagues at the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, um, they have been relentlessly working towards compiling um, what is now known as the um, uh, Salvagine Census. And so the census is the collection of all the data sets that have been curated by the team of curators um, hired at, at CZI and the Lattice Project. It, the uniqueness of this data set is that a lot of effort has actually been put into making the data consistent, to make it more usable. So there is a metadata schema, and there is a team that curates each of the data sets that get contributed to the census to make sure this schema is followed. At the moment, and this is a growing collection, we have 
about 45 million cells that are available with a total of 682 cell types. And also one of the interesting things in here is that these cell types have been mapped to the controlled vocabulary of the cell ontology. So these let us create some type of harmonization across the different data sets that, um, that the authors contribute. And if you, if you want to learn more about these, I recommend you check out Pablo's talk tomorrow afternoon, where he's going to go through the technical details of how the, how the team made the, the data available and the tools they had to build to really now make these easily queryable from Python. So there's kind of like a API that all the data is really easy to, easy to grab and, um, and start working with. But let me take um, kind of like a step back in here. So what we're trying to achieve is to go from raw data to insights. And in single cell omics, that means that we will need to establish best practices both at how we perform experiments and how do we analyze the data. And we need to have benchmarking methodology for the analysis methods. It can be something like popularity, like we believe in the wisdom of the crowd. But we also need to have quantitative uh, benchmarks. And the problem is these independent um, benchmarks, they are many times a heavy lift because there is no common infrastructure that can be reused and they are hard to expand and can become quickly outdated. And so to try to um, address that challenge, this was what motivated us to start Open Problems. So the Open Problems in Single Cell Analysis aims to be a living benchmark framework associated with living best practices and living reproducible pipelines. One of the key aspects on open problems is that the tasks that we are trying to address, they are driven by the community. And currently, the tasks that we have available, if you check the, the website, are um, data denoising, batch correction, multimodal data integration, dimensionality reduction, label propagation, cell-cell communication, and spatial deconvolution, but this is by no means a limited list. And what we are really looking for is for people to join this open community, contribute their tasks, contribute their methods, and brainstorm together with us how we can design data sets that then can be processed in a very consistent manner and that really help to standardize how benchmarking is done and make it reproducible. So everything in open problems is built openly um, with and for the community. So we have um, just like an illustration in here kind of like the, the life cycle of how we think about the tasks in the, in the evaluations. The results um, get published. This is continuously refreshed. And then um, let me kind of like take a, a deep dive into one of the tasks just to kind of like illustrate a bit um, how it, it looks kind of like a bit more in detail. So for example, if we look at cell-cell communication, this task in particular includes two subtasks, which are defined by different types uh, of ground truth. So in one hand, we have the spatial spot colocalization um, in the source target um, ta ta um, subtask. And um, we have the cytokine profiling in the ligand target subtask. And then we run methods on each task to score the likelihood of the interaction between source and target cell types, or ligand and target cell types, respectively. And then we use the area under the curve and the odds ratio to score um, methods 
output. And the result of that is what you can see here in the right. And hopefully, I've been able to kind of like convey the message that um, engaging the community, the machine learning community, but the, in general, the software engineering community is centered uh, for open problems. And as part of that effort, we've been running annual competitions for different tasks, from multimodal data integration to multimodal data integration across time. Um, and this year, we have um, one more competition coming later in the year where um, the goal is to uh, generalize, is to, is to predict um, unseen um, perturbations and cell types. So if this is of interest to you, please uh, think about applying. So I want to um, pivot here and um, kind of like really kind of like take just like a quick break to appreciate that human biology is incredibly complex. And the goal that we have here is really to leverage the amazing advances in computer science and machine learning that are transforming our ability to interpret high content data and helping transform the way we find effective therapies. And that was um, the motivation that led me to join in situ. Because at the heart uh, of our vision is, is that most diseases today that remain without disease-modifying treatment, um, the reason is that they are still very defined by qualitative, subjective clinical symptoms. And so if we can perhaps unravel the underlying biology, we might be able to more accurately predict which interventions will meaningfully modulate disease. So at the core of our approach is the integration of a broad range of high content data generated in the labs that are from human-derived in vitro cellular disease models, and also taking advantage of existing high content clinical data um, collected from humans data set similar to the ones that I have so kind of like been um, presenting in the first part of the talk. And we bring these data types together into an integrated framework, and then we use machine learning to create embeddings that capture the language of biological states as they are represented in this data. And so what this really let us do is to move away from these fuzzy definitions of diseases that I'm illustrating here with the, mu the fuzzy mosaic on the left to clear and sharper data-driven um, definitions. And then we layer on top the ability to interrogate and assess the effects of genetic interventions. And these genetic interventions, the way we think about them is both the ones that we can execute in the lab, but also the human experiments of nature that we can get from the in vivo data sets. And this analysis is really enabling us to get to multiple types of insights. So we can get to targets, as in genetic drivers or modulators of clinical outcome. We can get to quantitative machine learned biomarkers that enable the success of clinical development by identifying the right patients and the right clinical outcomes, and therapeutic interventions that can effectively modulate those targets. And so based on these insights, what we're trying to do is to build a pipeline that um, we have enabled therapeutic programs by taking um, this approach. And so the, the platform that, that we are currently deploying is leveraging human data acquisition, cellular data generation, and really integrating all of these through cutting edge machine learning models that give rise to a range of novel insights. And so for us, the drug discovery efforts really go hand in hand with the compute workflows. 
So when we're thinking about clinical machine learning, and the machine learning enable statistical genetics for patient state, we are very often thinking about variant calling that we commonly do um, using open source tools like GATK or GWAS um, studies where we look for genomic association. When we are looking into cell ML, where the, what we are trying to get at is to predict cell-based disease models in, um, from the cell state, most of this is leveraging single cell RNA-seq, which I described to you in the context of the ATLAS, but also image processing and image screens. And all of this is jointly analyzed using machine learning. And we are also thinking about molecular design. So machine learning enable therapeutic design with DNA encoded libraries and cellular screens. And this let us do chemoinformatics, virtual libraries, and the Dell analysis. And so really, when you think about all of these, nearly all these compute that we are doing, we can think about it in some kind of workflow. And the challenge here is that we have many different domains. We have bioinformatics, we have imaging, we have chemistry, we have data engineering. Each domain have their own best practice. So um, for example, in bioinformatics, it's very common to use Nextflow. It's what we are using, for example, in open problems. So using them all together often leads to a really hard to maintain code base. And this was what motivated us to create, but also to open source um, Redone. And so Redone is a workflow engine. Um, the code is, is available uh, from GitHub, and there are a couple of um, blog posts uh, if you are interested in, in going through more of the, of the details. That, but the, the nuance that I think is, is um, very interesting about Redone is that in addition to what I would consider to be more common workflow capabilities, such as task parallelization and distributed compute, what it offers is a unique approach to also store and sync the data provenance. And although I'm not gonna go into too, too much in detail about the language here, if you, if you are interested, please come, me, come find me at the break. I wanna just highlight a couple of the interesting things about Redon. And one of them is the code um, really looks uh, Pythonic. Um, so this um, hopefully elim eliminates um, the entry barrier. And because bioinformatics is core to the drug discovery effort that we are doing, we have already some examples that people can uh, leverage to deploy at, at, their own, um, work, at their own work. And the, one of the very nice features is that it allows for mixed computed backends. And, the, and if, as I said, if you have kind of like further questions, um, come find me and I can um, also put you in touch with the engineering team. They'll be very happy to, to talk about this in, in detail. Um, but I want to kind of like end here thinking that data science is much about the code as it is about the actual data. And while in the software engineering world, we have really been, um, I think, mindful of how code is tracked and stored, that level of thought hasn't really um, penetrated into the data side of the scale, and it's often hard to find how it was executed and where did the, the data go. And so what we, what we have built in here is a way that we can keep track of data provenance because it is as important to know what happens to the data and where did the data go 
edit is um, about the code. But then, in order for us to really be able to execute on our premise of leveraging machine learning to advance drug discovery, we need to have a data strategy that unifies workflows in data provenance, and that includes data cataloging, where we are also taking advantage of open source initiatives, such as uh, Open Lineages and the Data Hub project. And so I've started my talk by uh, walking you through the process of building references of human in vivo data. And the drug discovery strategy that we have adopted encompasses the analysis of such data to derive genetic and phenotypic insights. And we're combining that with in vivo systems that we've leveraged to create multimodal data powered by machine learning models, really letting us taking advantage of many incredible open source community driven projects and tools. And we are putting this all together now to get novel um, insights into disease that will hopefully lead um, to better drugs. And so on this note, I really want to kind of like thank everybody that has been participating in these projects, from the Tableau project, the Open uh, Problems community, and also the, um, the team um, at Insidru. And thank you for, for your attention. I'm happy to, to take questions, uh, and you can come find me at the conference during the day today and tomorrow. Thank you, Angela. This was a wonderful talk. Um, questions on Slack, keynote channel, or in the room? We have questions. Hi, um, thank you for presenting that. It was a really good oversight of a lot of different steps in the process and a lot of different concerns you have. I am curious though, as you're amassing all this genetic data, what kind of protections, what kind of de-identifying are you doing to make sure that this protects uh, at least the people surviving, if, if not the people it's, that the work is derived from? Thank you. That's an incredible question. Thank you so much for asking that. Let me jump back a couple slides in, in here, because I think the one that we can use to ground our conversation is one of the slides that I had at the beginning in here in terms of the clinical metadata that we collect, for example, under, ta under Tabula Sapiens. So for Tabula Sapiens, all the donations are from deceased patients. However, we have still the responsibility with the families. And one of the things that we have on the way that we have procured the data is that we will not perform our genome sequencing of the samples. And although this is not required, we felt compelled, so by the, regu the, um, the, regu the ethical regulations for um, scientific research, if the donor is deceased, you do not need to put extra protections in place. But we felt compelled to ask everyone that we share the raw data with to sign a data use agreement that they will obey to the same uh, regulations that we have of not trying to de-anonymize the, the patient. So all of these data, when we get the medical records from the partner that we work with, Donor Network West, they have no information about the, the donor. But in theory, you could still, if you really wanted to, try to de-anonymize, and you could try to reverse, kind of like from the RNA re kind of like the RNA that got into CRNA and get back to the genome. And so we just have put as many protections that we can think of in place. Um, if you then just get the gene count tables, kind of like what I use as the basis to produce this figure in here, there is, I don't think, a way that you can really de-anonymize that. This is the first answer to the part of your question. Now, the other question that you ask is, what about samples that we might have from people that are still living? So at Incitro, we work um, 
in genetic diseases, for example. And what we have done is to establish partnerships with, um, with networks that do patient support. And they have taken care of also that. So when we get the samples, we are basically in agreement with, with these um, support uh, institutions to, to then make sure that we obey to, to what is um, accepted in, in that field. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Uh, I have one question from Slack. Um, can you say a little bit more about Redone and like what led to developing a new sort of uh, workflow engine rather than using some of the existing uh, existing ones? Absolutely, and and that is that's kind of like the great question, and also why um, kind of like in Redone we typically kind of like just say like yet another redundant workflow engine <laughs> and kind of like the joke um, is baked in the the reason that really motivated redone is the component of tracking also the data provenance so the workflow languages in terms of the processing of the data like I tried to try to mention in terms of like the data pipelining I I agree that probably that we could have found an existing solution already that we could have just deployed. But the challenge really came when we also want to track hand in hand the data provenance. And so for us to build these graphs that let us track both the code and the data, we, we felt that it, would, it made more sense to, to build, to build the, a new engine. Thank you. Julie, you said there was a Hi, uh, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Hi, thanks uh, for the presentation. Um, I was just curious uh, with the in situ work and what you're planning to do. Um, are there specific diseases or markers or like some applications you can talk about, um, like focus areas? Because I think in the last slide you hit a, a bunch of big fields, um, but presumably you'll you've already started somewhere or have somewhere to start. I was just curious what is of interest to in situ, and then also. Um, if you could comment on uh, how you would be incorporating like uh, the kind of ongoing academic work, like the knowledge of, of places to look for or, or how that can sort of feed into your model, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so, okay, let me answer the, the first one um, to start. So. Um, Intitro is focusing on three main um, therapeutic areas, um, neurosciences, metabolic diseases, and oncology. And in these are reasonably broad uh, umbrella uh, terms. So in the, um, in the neurosciences, we have two particular focus um, in uh, tuber sclerosis and ALS. And so what we what we are using to really try to inform our decision because it's of course the goal is that you are really kind of like thinking about finding the best drug for the best um, group of patients. One of the things that we we are using to ground our decisions is diseases that have a genetic component because then we can um, take advantage of the genetic experiments from nature to try to really understand causality. Um, but then the oncology oncology space, I think this kind of like ties into, into the second uh, part of your question. So one of the interesting uh, pieces of work that we, that we have done on, on that space is kind of like goes back to knowing that these resources exist. And so one of the big data sets for oncology is the TCGA, so the Tumor Cancer Genome Atlas. And we knew that for some of the data um, on the TCGA, there was paired histology and ataxic. So histology is these uh, tissue sections that are commonly done in a pathology laboratory, so this is a routine technique that you have, um, you just have kind of like a, 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 an idea of how the tissue looks like. So the pathologists are trained to look at this. 
and a taxic is a measurement of chromatin accessibility. So it is usually thought as an inference to how likely a gene is to, to, be, to eventually be expressed or not, because the, the chromatin, which is kind of like wrapping the DNA, is more accessible. So knowing that there was paired data, we trained the model to see if we could impute uh, from the histology into the ataxic, and then we extended that to the entire TCGA histology cohort, and we were able to show um, that the risk scores and uh, that we compute from the imputed data are cleaner than what we can compute from the, um, the non-imputed data. And so this is kind of like trying to answer the second part of your question. One of the, the things that we, we do at in situ is really try to leverage the knowledge of everybody that has joined of kind of like with the, with the motivation for us is can we really understand disease and then can we find a way of treating it? And so all these, all these community efforts that we are aware of, that we are part of, we bring them in-house and try to contribute and to use them for improving drug discovery. Thank you. Uh, one more question from Slack. Uh, what's the funding model for the open problems that bio? Is it a single grant or do the participating institutions pitch in with fees or is it something else? Uh, the person was curious about the sustainability plans for the computational infrastructure and the people necessary to keep it going. And they said thank you for your talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, great question. Um, we, we think a lot about that. So um, open problems has been kindly sponsored by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. They are our main, our main supporter. Um, and then the um, work is mostly done, um, so we, we might pay developers out of, the, out of the grant, and then the rest of it is done uh, in a volunteer basis. We think a lot about the sustainability of, of it and kind of like maybe like jumping in here. We are always looking for, for sponsorship. So for the competitions, we've had sponsorship from, from AWS, even from 10X for, for data generation. Um, but it's, it's a question that we are really at kind of like the core team trying to answer ourselves. So apologies to the person who answered the question. I don't have a better answer. But I would very much welcome Brainstorm. And there are no fees to, to join. The institutions don't pay. This is an open source community project. And we really believe that the more our people join us, the, the more, more chances we will have to succeed. Something that, that we have been thinking about is whether we could deploy this infrastructure into a way that for example, if a company wanted to use it without making their data available, then on that situation, we could perhaps monetize it and that would serve to uh, support our development work. But conversations are happening and I would welcome um, feedback and brainstorming with people interested on, on this type of work. Thank you. Other questions in the room? There's one more on Slack then. Um, is there a common set of tools you use for post-workflow analysis of the data? I'm going to assume that question is for single cell. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so for, for single cell, um, most of the data analysis that, that is done, so there are two main um, libraries that are used in Python is ScanPy and in R is Surat. And the ecosystem tries really to plug into, into those tools. Um, to do the downstream analysis, what is commonly done is differential gene expression. So there are different algorithms to compute differential gene expression. Pathway enrichment, so that you want to try to associate the changes that you see with the genes with possible functions, and those are typically done with tools such as Enricher or GSEA. And, uh, and, and then these days we are really starting to see the surge of uh, deep learning um, into trying to kind of like take this data 
into the into the next level and a couple models have been published recently um sc bird sc gpt uh, gene transformer and i think we're gonna we're just starting to see the beginning um of those uh, but if the, the person who asked the question wants to kind of like reach out, I'm happy to kind of like go in more detail and maybe give a, a more tailored answer because I just like give a, a very generic one. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Angela. That was a wonderful talk. And thank you for answering all these questions.